Tonight on Greater Boston, Globe columnist Renee Graham and GBH senior investigative reporter Philip Martin join me on the spread of the white supremacist hate that took 10 more lives on Saturday at a Buffalo grocery store. Then later, a documentary ode to the beloved New York and Philadelphia restaurant chain Horn and Harda, The Automat, featuring some very famous people who spent many of their nickels there. And finally, a few words of appreciation for Celtics forward Grant Williams for his work on the court and off. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. I'm sad, I'm hurt, I'm mad because I never would have thought it would have happened here. The disbelief and pain coming from yet another community, this time Buffalo, where an 18-year-old white man shot and killed 10 people and hurt three others at a grocery store in a predominantly black neighborhood in the city on Saturday. 11 of the 13 people shot were black, and police are investigating it as a hate crime. And before we get further into that racist massacre, I want to take a minute to remember the victims, those with full lives stolen from them this weekend. 67-year-old Hayward Patterson, a church deacon who often volunteered to drive people who didn't have transportation to the grocery store. 77-year-old Pearl Young, a substitute teacher whose family says she was a pillar of the community. 55-year-old Aaron Salter, a security guard and retired Buffalo police officer who died exchanging fire with the shooter. 72-year-old Catherine Cat Massey, who was known for her civil rights advocacy and had written a letter to a local newspaper just days before urging passage of more gun control. 86-year-old Ruth Whitfield, who sang in her choir's parish and had been caring for her husband, who was in a nursing home. 32-year-old Roberta Drury, whose family told the New York Times she was always the center of attention and made the whole room smile. 65-year-old Celestine Cheney, whose family described her as a loving mother and grandmother and, quote, probably the sweetest person you could meet. 52-year-old Margus Morrison, who helped take care of his mother, who's disabled. 53-year-old Andre McNeil, whose family called him a loving guy. He was at the grocery store to pick up treats to surprise his grandson. And 62-year-old Geraldine Talley, a devoted mother and grandmother, whose family says she was the glue who kept them all together. The shooter admitted to police that he specifically targeted black shoppers and reportedly posted a manifesto just days prior full of white supremacist sickness and a racist conspiracy theory known as the Great Replacement, which baselessly claims non-white people are being brought to America to, quote, replace white voters, fueled at least in part by the racist words and actions of former President Donald Trump through travel bans, immigration policies, and dog whistle after dog whistle that have helped normalize white supremacy to the point that local government officials right here seem to think it's fine to joke about bringing, quote, dark friends to events to prove they aren't racist, as we learned last week happened in Everett. I'm joined now by Boston Globe columnist Renee Graham and GBH News senior investigative reporter Philip Martin, who's been covering white supremacist groups nationally and right here in Massachusetts. Renee and Philip, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jim. Renee, this is not the first mass murderer motivated by this kind of sickness. There was, what, 23 people killed in the Walmart at El Paso. Uh, uh, the killer talked about Hispanic invaders, the synagogue in Pittsburgh, immigrant invaders, 11 killed there. Is there any reason to think this is the end of the line? Oh, not at all. Um, it just keeps continuing and continuing. And I think something, a lot has to change. One thing we have to start with is to cease looking at these as lone wolf attacks. They are not. They are, you know, I'm not saying that they all knew each other, but they certainly influence each other. You know, you could see in the manifesto from the, from the alleged Buffalo shooter, things that were in a manifesto written by a man in New Zealand, who attacked two mosques and killed right. 50 people. There is a thread that connects all of them. This is a concerted effort to push this idea of white replacement theory, which has gone mainstream, which has always been on the fringes of white extremism, but is now very much part of the mainstream, including the Republican Party. I want to talk about it entering the mainstream in a second, but Philip, your reporting suggests that this kind of sentiment is not alien to Massachusetts either. 
Um, not at all. Uh, we're, we're seeing it here, and, and to Renee's point about the connecting uh, tissue, if you will, of what this movement is, the fact that these individuals, they may act as individuals, but of course, they're not lone. Uh, in other words, they're not lone wolves. They're connected by something that's also called White Lives Matter, which is a movement of, of disparate individuals and groups, including some here in Massachusetts, uh, uh, NSC 131, uh, something called the National Social Club. Uh, they are a part of this, uh, this grouping of white supremacist groups that rely on mainstream messaging, that which have become mainstream messaging, including the great replacement theory, no matter what you call it. Uh, uh, the Camus, not Albert Camus, but the other Camus, Renaud Camus in France, uh, coined this notion of great replacement theory, and it's taken hold in the United States, reverberated on Fox News, uh, and heard uh, by uh, hate groups, echoed by hate groups here in Massachusetts. As I mentioned, Jim, NSC-131 is one such group. Uh, they have been parading around uh, uh, the state for, uh, for more than two years now, including at the recent St. Patrick's Day parade, uh, it, uh, trying to scare uh, uh, people and telling white people through flyers, online, uh, publications, through social media, that they are, in fact, uh, in danger of losing uh, their place in American society. A, re uh, a reference, again, to the Great Replacement Theory, yeah. and as Renee said, reflected in Republican Party talking points these days. Well, let's hear from a Republican uh, who echoes both of your sentiments. This is Liz Cheney on Twitter this morning. The House GOP leadership has enabled white nationalism, white supremacy, and anti-Semitism. History has taught us that what begins with words ends in far worse. GOP leaders must renounce and reject these views and those who hold them. You know, you mentioned a minute ago, Renee, that this used to be fringe extremist stuff, now mainstream. Laura Ingram and Tucker Carlson on Fox News, members of Congress, as you and Liz Cheney mentioned, the presidency, at least a president. When did it make the jump, and why did it make the jump from the fringes to, as you say, right in the center of American culture? Well, I think there are two things important to note, Jim, that this isn't new, that this has been going on not decades, but for centuries. You can go back to the New York draft riots in 1863, and what drove those riots was the idea that whites feared that emancipated Black people were going to take their jobs, that they were going to be replaced by emancipated Black people. And that set off a race massacre in New York that killed 1,000 people, most of whom were Black, who were either beaten to death or lynched. This isn't new. Where things changed was in 2015 when Donald Trump ran for president. And he kept stressing this point, we are going to take back the country, which fostered the idea that something that belonged to certain people had been stolen from them. Once he became president, he continued to double down and triple down on that idea. And that gave it credence. That gave it legitimacy. And that allowed, allowed a lot of people who might have thought this in the back of their minds to suddenly say it out loud. So the line from Donald Trump to having sitting senators and representatives saying this, to hearing it in prime time every single night on television, you know, isn't that hard to believe, but that's the problem. You know, once a president of the United States was saying it, and a lot in the media didn't want to confront what he was saying, because they were talking about economic anxiety and not the pure racism that was behind it, that legitimized this movement. I want to stay with you for a second, Renee, though. Uh, I, he wasn't talking about economic anxiety two years later after Charlottesville. Here's uh, what was being said in Charlottesville, and here's the infamous response from uh, Trump. Here it is. You You also had people that were very fine people on both sides. That was the tipping point for people who'd been disconnected to this, Renee, was it not? That was the invitation in, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I can remember after Trump spoke, and even, even when he spoke immediately after what happened in Charlottesville, David Duke congratulated Trump. He yeah. was happy that Trump did not call them out. That was affirmation for these people. And that's exactly what Trump did. And every time the media refused to push back, refused to call Trump out on his racism, to even call him a racist, they also gave it credence and they gave it power. 
You know, speaking of the media, you mentioned Fox News, Philip. I want to play a second of Tucker Carlson. If people haven't seen this, the New York Times about a week ago did a brilliant analysis of all the shows that Carlson has done, and they documented that on at least 400 segments, uh, he talked about that which he said he never advanced, which is the Great Replacement Theory, white supremacy. Here's just one example from uh, earlier in the year. Never wants to make a racial issue out of it. Ooh, the you know white replacement theory. No, no, no. This is a voting rights question. I have less political power because they're importing a brand new electorate. Why should I sit back and take that? You know, someone uh, texted us today on the radio, Philip, and said, you know, okay, he's the top-rated show, but it's only so many million people. And another listener directed us to a Google, an analysis Google had done that talked about the three spikes ever in searching for white supremacy. One of the three was after people had called for Tucker Carlson to be fired because of those kinds of statements. So there's a direct line between Carlson's mouth and this infecting uh, uh, as broad a spectrum of the culture as it has, is there not? Absolutely. These things are amplified. Uh, Tucker Carlson may have three million viewers on any given night, for example. That's amplified many times over on social media. Uh, you'll see that on Twitter. You'll see that uh, in uh, social media, on social media platforms preferred by the, the far right, such, uh, such as Telegraph. And, and so this, it's not a question of whether or not uh, it's uh, simply confined, if you will, uh, to one show, because it isn't. It's amplified. The same thing is true with hate groups, for example, in Massachusetts, uh, and for that matter, uh, Rhode Island and across New England. They may, in fact, represent about 20, 30 people at most uh, and have, a, have a, a demonstration of 20, 30 people at most. But what they're saying is often amplified. The Patriot Front, for example, another group, another white supremacist group, supremacist group, rather, here in Massachusetts and in New England, they have put up posters and banners throughout the, uh, the area, uh, uh, again, talking about the victimization of white people because of uh, policies of equity and diversity. I've seen comments in newspapers, local newspapers, defending them, saying, how can you, in fact, describe them as white supremacists? Because they're, in fact, saying what we believe. And so you have uh, uh, comments that are essentially, uh, essentially reverberated within, uh, w within uh, uh, by these groups uh, that, might, as Renee said, at any other time in the past, might have seen extreme post-civil rights, but have now made their way into the mainstream without question. You know, Renee, it, there's been some conversation of the weapon that uh, this guy is using. One of the perverse parts of this is, you know, the, the BS line from the NRA is all the time, the way to prevent this is just arm everybody. And of course, Aaron Salter, the, the guard, was armed, shot at this killer. It, he had body armor on, and then the killer uh, ended the life of Aaron Salter. It seems to me that even if gun control was in the mix, which it surely is not, it doesn't cure the disease that you are both describing. What does? You know, I, I think there's a few things. I do think that this is yet another time to have a conversation about gun reform and how it is that an 18-year-old could not buy a pack of cigarettes legally, yeah. but could buy a weapon of war, not to mention body armor. But I also think, and I was feeling this throughout the weekend, is that at some point, white people in this country need to carry this load. It is too much to ask of black people and brown people and Jews to have to constantly deal with this while being targeted and burying their dead. People need to talk to their families. People need to see what's going on with their kids because a lot of these people who are doing these things are quite young. This guy was 18. The shooter in Charlottesville was in the... Um, the shooter in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, oh, was in his early 20s. Oh, yeah. This is a problem, and it cannot be only carried by the people who were targeted. This is not a black problem. This is an American problem. And I believe that all Americans, including white people, who might feel like they can sit on the sidelines because they are not racist, that's not good enough anymore. But Jim, can because what's quick, happening is going to impact them as well. I literally have 30 seconds, Philip. It's yours. Jim, I just want to uh, add uh, to that. Uh, a, a psychologist I spoke with said it's a slippery slope to go from, for example, Franklin High School recently shouting anti-Semitic yeah. racist comments into descending into 
white supremacy and possibly even joining these groups. And so folks, parents, everyone has to watch what your kids are watching and seeing online because that's another source of hate. And when you have politicians like we have in Everett who use the N-word and talk about inviting their dark friends to show that they're not racist. Exactly. You've got to deal with that right in your own backyard as well. Renee Graham, Philip Martin, as always, really appreciate your thoughts. Thanks Thank so you, much. Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Next up, if you're a person of a certain age who ever spent any significant time in New York City or my hometown of Philly, the next two words will bring a wave of nostalgia, the automat. For the rest of you, a new documentary tells you all about what you missed out on, the beloved restaurant chain brought to us by two men, Horton Harder. You walked in, you shoved a nickel into a coin slot of your choice, turned a knob, and opened a little door to retrieve some of the best food and drinks on the planet, as comedian Mel Brooks pays tribute to in the film in a song he wrote for the film. There was nothing like the coffee at the automat. Its aroma and its flavor were supreme. From a silver dolphin spout, the coffee poured right out. Not to mention, at the end, a little spurt of cream. The documentary is called What Else? The Automat, and the filmmaker behind it is Lisa Hurwitz, who joins me now. Lisa, congratulations. It's great to meet you. Thank you so much, and I'm so excited that the film has just opened in Boston. Yeah, well, we'll tell people where they can go check it out. By the way, I went maybe 300 times when I was a kid. I tried to do a calculation last night. I didn't make the film. You never went, but you did. So what was the motivation? It's so random, but I loved eating in my college cafeteria. It was a really wonderful place for me, and I started researching cafeterias in my school library, and that was where I found out about Horn and Hard Arts Automat. I'm from the West Coast. My folks are not East Coast people. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't know about it. So it was just this incredible discovery, and I was never able to forget it. So it's been quite a while since I first learned about the Automat, but it stuck with me. And at a certain point, I started working on this documentary, not knowing what it was going to really turn into and the types of folks that were going to ultimately become a part of it. Yeah, we'll talk about those folks in a couple of seconds. But for those who never had the pleasure of being there or haven't seen the film yet, could you just describe the big picture? This is not like any cafeteria that somebody watching the show ever went to. Describe the, the big scene and then the wall. All right, so we're talking about these large, beautiful spaces where people would spend actually a good chunk of their lives. You would go all the time to eat at the Automat and they were all over New York City. There were Horn and Hard Arts all over Philadelphia. And you would go in there, you'd give your dollar to a cashier and the cashier without even looking would just convert your dollar into 20 nickels. And this was the very famous nickel thrower. You then would proceed to these walls lined with beautiful Carrara glass marble vending machines where you would put your nickel into a slot and then take your food out of a little glass cubby. And so this is what really set apart Horn and Hard Arts Cafeteria from all the others. It was the automat. Well, and also high ceilings, marble tables, chrome around the little windows and on the knob. It was unbelievable. You mentioned the folks in your film. Here are uh, just a couple of conversations you had with a few people who I'm guessing people will recognize. Here it is. It was a good place to eat. The food was delicious. The prices were right. There were all kinds of people, from poor people to matrons in furs. This photo was taken when I was about seven years old. I'm living in the South Bronx, immigrant family, not making a great deal of money. So you have to understand, we almost never went to a restaurant. So going to an automat was not just the experience of seeing this mechanized food delivery system, it was going to a restaurant. In the 60s, there was a group that we organized. We met on the second floor of Horn and Harlock's at 15th and Market, where there were ideas about what could happen if we work hard enough. It was the birth of the black political movement in Philadelphia, which led to my being able to run for mayor of Philadelphia. 
I have never stopped threading everything we've done at Starbucks with that initial experience. How do you create that level of theater, excitement, surprise, and delight? He should treat the people at Starbucks as well as Horn and Harder treated their own employees. The re one of the common threads through those interviews, particularly with Bader Ginsburg and Colin Powell and Wilson Good, but some others as well, this was right the great leveler, rich and poor, black and white. Essentially, it was this it was democracy at its best. Is that a fair way to describe it? It is, and one of the greatest things about the Automat was how it was just good enough for everyone. You could find all kinds of people there. It was this incredible private space that really acted like a, a public space. People would just go there. There was nothing embarrassing about it, even though it was incredibly cheap. It was such high quality in every way. So. Uh, it Women were just starting to enter the workforce when H Horn and Hart at H&H, &H, as I called it as a kid, the automat exploded. Women felt safe there. Explain that a little bit. So we're talking turn of the century. Women didn't used to go out on their own to eat, but women needed a place to go eat because they were starting to work, particularly as secretaries, as stenographers. And so that's really when the cafeteria became a thing. They were restaurants for women. And there were so many cafeterias, but really Horn and Hardart outlived the others and stood out because they had something that the others didn't. And of course, Horn and Hardart appeared in so many films and television shows over the course of its life and even you know, to this day, it continues to make appearances. There really was not another cafeteria with the cachet of the automat. And it wasn't just women, immigrants, as you say in your film, you didn't have to speak the language because all you needed to do was ask for nickels and pop them into the slot. And I love Mel Brooks's line. The other reason he loved it, no tips, which was a big deal as, as well. Also, their reputation this is Horn and Hart, the founders of this thing, of treating the workers there particularly well. You deal, you interview this guy, Apache Ramos, who worked there for a long period of time. It's pretty clear that there was this incredibly loyal relationship in both directions, no? Absolutely, and something that the company had, which I loved, was a 25-year club. And they had a lot of employees who were a member of this group that would do activities together that had been with the company for more than 25 years. Why did it come apart at the seams when it finally did? When it, we should say, by the way, even though it was only in two cities, it was the largest restaurant chain in America at the time, even though Philly and New York were its only homes. Why did it come apart when it did? Well, it's true. Just by sheer volume, the amount of business they were doing in these two cities put them as number one in the country only to be replaced by McDonald's. They had a huge battle. The world completely changed and they really were not prepared for it. I think nowadays restaurants are very, they're forecasting into the future. You know, Howard Schultz from Starbucks, he's one of the characters in the yeah. documentary. And when I interviewed him, something that, you know, he said to me that I'll never forget is that he doesn't take his success for granted and that every day he fights for it and that they're, they're projecting very far into the future in terms of anticipating how everything is going to change. And Horn and Hardart was just a very, at the end of the day, kind of a mom and pop. Mel Brooks used the words naive and innocent to describe the automat. And I think so were the executives of the company because after World War II, Americans changed. Yeah. They left the cities. Yeah. They wanted a different kind of dining experience. And all of a sudden, they had a slew of competition. Yeah. By the way, Mel Brooks is not only doesn't not only sings that song, he's all over the film, including telling Lisa how to make the movie in the movie itself. One of my other favorite movies, Lisa, I thought you were joking when the little descriptor under this guy's name said, Automat historian. This is what this guy studied as an academic. Here's a little bit of your exchange with him. How did you pick that for your PhD dissertation? That's not it. <laughs> so that, 
I, I chose the automat as a, as a topic. I was a, studying to be a, become a historian of technology. I needed a topic for my dissertation. And I was in Amsterdam at the time when I stumbled across the automatique. That triggered this vague memory because my parents took me to one of this restaurant that I thought it had the same sort of machine. And it turns out, he says, it was Horn and Hardit. So Lisa, how much do you regret that you never got to put in a nickel and take out a pumpkin pie, which was my second favorite, baked beans and a crock pot, which was my number one favorite? How much do you regret that you'll never have that experience except on film? You know, every time I do a Q&A, it, it always comes up that I'm so jealous of everyone who has these memories. I would be there every day. I think it would be a wonderful thing to have in my life. By the way, I was there every day, and I'm really sad I'm not in your ah! film, but I'm so glad to see it. Lisa, terrific film. Everybody should see it. Thanks for your time. You can catch The Automat playing now at the Coolidge Theater. It'll also be at the West Newton Cinema this Friday and on video on demand in July. Finally tonight, congratulations to Celtics forward Grant Williams, who led the team to a Game 7 win over the Bucs in the Eastern Conference semifinals yesterday. In the process, he broke an NBA record for most three-pointers attempted in a Game 7 and tied the record for most threes scored, making seven out of 18 shots. But Williams hasn't just been doing big things for Boston on the court. As we learned when he joined me last spring, he's been doing his part off the court as well working to convince people to get that COVID-19 vaccine. I felt like it was the safest route possible for us to get back now into normal, but also to protect the, the people that we care about because COVID is, I've seen it affect uh, many other, many people close to my heart, uh, whether it was with illness, with death, or even um, with symptoms that just didn't seem like they were necessary or, or wanted by any means. It was just a necessary thing that I felt like would help uh, not only my community that I'm, that I'm part of, but also um, this world that we're in. Did I mention he's 23? What an impressive young leader in more ways than one. And I just might know where he gets it from. You mentioned your mother getting the vaccine. She works at NASA. Is she an engineer I read at NASA? Is that correct? Electrical engineer, correct. How excited was she by the Mars landing? Oh, she was, she's been sending me emails about everything. She <laughs> tries to keep me informed, whether it's not only with NASA, but also SpaceX in terms of uh, all the different things that are, are gonna happen in the future. Uh, I know they've been working for commercial travels to space for the longest, so uh, there's a lot of exciting things to come, and I think that it's a bright future ahead. And a bright future for them both. That's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. Thank you for watching. Please stay safe.